Am I on? Yeah, oh, yeah. I am. God is worthy Amen. to be praised. Oh, I could just really feel the Holy Spirit here. It's so important. You know, we're allowed to have feelings. We're allowed to sense his spirit within us and to boldly go in that place with him. And that's what I'm praying. That's what I'm, my prayer is for me today, to boldly speak out what God has prepared for me. He's prepared for all of us. And uh, so it begins. Four years ago, God led me to prepare my first ever sermon on the Valley of Dry Bones, which is in the book of Ezekiel. We'll be reading that in a few minutes. Four years later today, I believe God not only wants me to dig up my old sermon, which was old and forgotten, but for all of us to look at those dead things in our lives, the spiritually dead, what we have forgotten about. It's old. It's over there. We don't see it anymore. No, he wants us to pay attention and to dig up those things because with God, death is not the end of the conversation. It can't be. He sent his one and only son to die on the cross for us. He paid the price. It's finished. It's done. Amen. And it's through his love, his grace, his mercy, that he can raise us out of the grave to live and to believe again. God wants North Point Church to be on the map and to be counted. Our city is having revivals right now, our country and our world. This is serious stuff, people, and this message that God gave me, he's dealt with me on this. And um, we are God's hands, his feet, his mouthpiece. We are the body of Christ, and we get to choose if we're going to participate with him in what he is doing, which is a revival. Uh, which, and it can be a continuous revival in our lives, truly worshiping our God and giving all glory to him. As I pulled this old sermon out of the cobwebs, God did something with me. He said, you know what? I want you to keep the story of Krista. It's time. I want you to tell the story of Krista, my daughter, and throw everything else out. I was like, well, you know, that inspired, you know, a lot of confidence there, right, God? But he's like, no, no, it's time. It is time right now to come alive again, to believe again. And interestingly enough, two days ago, February 24th, is the seventh year anniversary to where Chris's story begins. And there's parallels with the Valley of Dry Bones. That's why... I had this in my original sermon. And it all began on February 24th, 2016. And Krista was 16 years old. My husband and I, we brought her to the hospital. <clears throat> and uh, after several complications, she fell into a coma. And there was so much damage. And a lot of the damage was done to her brain stem, which is the waking part of our brain. So as each day passed by, it became more and more unlikely that she would wake up. Uh, in fact, they said if she, by the slim chance that she did wake up, that she would be brain dead. So it was test after test, the doctors telling us each time. Uh, I felt like it was every day, just so, so much heaviness, so much darkness. And they would tell us, your daughter's not going to get better. She's gone. Prepare to say goodbye. And, you know, that's true. I mean, she was on a vent that was doing her breathing for her. Machines were giving her nutrients in her water. That's true. But that's God's child laying there. And he's the one who writes her story. 
And so no matter how hard it is, and it was, you guys, the pain did not leave me. It was just leave us. It was so deep. We couldn't shake it. But we had to go to God because we knew who our God was. And we're going to do that right now. We are going to go to his word and see what he has to say about all of our lives, not just Krista. If we can all turn to Ezekiel 37, 1 through 10. Because we want to hear God's heart. We want him to give us his, his words, his thoughts about our situation. You guys ready? Okay. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and their breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Let's pray. Oh, God, Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for cleansing us and washing us from our old ways, God. Thank you, Jesus, for your anointing power, God, that you drench us with your Holy Spirit, Jesus, God. We need you, God. Fill us to overflowing, God, I pray. I pray that we all decrease, God, and that you increase right here, right now, God, that we can hear your words, God, and that they will fill us, God, and that we will not be the same when we leave this building, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you're going to do, God, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. You're so good. Ezekiel, Ezekiel, the author of this book that the Valley of Dry Bones is in. My mouth is dry, too, as it gets up here. Um, Ezekiel was a prophet and a priest in the Old Testament, and he was also married. And he, uh, during this time, God, what he did is he gave Ezekiel this is the third vision that he gives Ezekiel. And uh, just a moment. And the timing of this third vision was after the fall of Jerusalem. So his people in Israel, they were exiled to Babylon. And so these people, Ezekiel, his wife, they were all forced out of their home and forced to live under a government a regime that hated them, if you can imagine that. People that despise you, that are your enemy, that are over you. So Ezekiel, as a priest, he became what you would see as a street preacher because the people were scattered all over. And his message to them was to warn them to repent, to come back to God, to believe again. He knew they had been faithless. He knew they had rejected God many, many times. But through this vision and through Ezekiel, God wanted to give the people hope 
again. He wanted to let them know that he wanted to restore their nation, to heal them. And if Ezekiel was alive today, I think he would agree with me to name my sermon, Dare to Believe God in the Impossible. Valley of the Dry Bones is good, but I think he would agree this is a better one. Uh, so, <laughs> Dare to Believe God in the Impossible. So this message begins where God is not just placing Ezekiel in this large valley of very dry bones. He is putting them front and center where he is surrounded by it. And he's getting such a good look. It's, it's a wake-up call. I mean, one time I saw a picture of somebody's rendition. It was a painting of what this valley would look like. And it was horrible. It was full of all these dead bones and death. It was depressing. It was dark. It was sad. And Ezekiel gets to be up close and personal with all of it. And, and I'm wondering if it hit home that maybe it looked like the spiritually dead in his, where he was living now in Babylon. And like a grave of captivity, and obviously this valley is where a battle took place. And these are the losers, right? And they're not the only ones who lose here. I mean, granted, they were probably taken away too soon, but they're leaving people behind that are looking at these men as their fathers, their sons, their brothers. And we know that death is hard. We know that separation from someone into another world, that it just it doesn't make sense to us, does it? I mean, it can't. It's, death is hard, it's painful, and we want to make sense of it, but we can't. We want to put the pieces together, but we can't. And if you think of the story of Lazarus, where he was in the tomb four days, dead and jesus comes on the scene and and he's going to bring lazarus back to to life again and martha and mary they're just having the hardest time like they can't make sense of what jesus says he's going to do and even martha goes up to jesus and says uh there's going to be a smell in there you know like we're at the odor you know and there's odor there and so the God of the, of the impossible that we serve and who we love, he doesn't go by our physical limitations. He just doesn't. And so it doesn't have to make sense. And if it's hard to believe in the Lazarus story and bringing him back after four days of being in the tomb, imagine these, these bones, these bones in this valley that are pa way past that stage. I mean, I imagine Ezekiel going up and as God is giving him this tour in and among these bones and having Ezekiel pick one of these bones up and it just crumbling to dust. He's so dry and so brittle. And if these bones in the valley are anything like us, a representation of us, that would be the, she's too far gone. Nope, nope, that marriage, it's done. Uh, the school, the government, well, they're collapsing. And there's no hope, right? And so it's true that without God, because there's going to be storms in life for all of us, there's going to be the harsh rains, the harsh winds, there's going to be the sun's heat beating down on us like those bones. And so without God, yes, it is quite impossible. But with God, death does not have to be the end of the conversation. So what does God do next? He asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? And he replies, Lord God, you know. If the dead bones were a wake-up call, then this question that God poses is where we need to focus our attention. What God? 
can these bones live? Really? Okay. Well, look at Abraham. He was 100 years old. Sarah was 90. And God said he was going to give them a child. Oh, boy. Are you kidding me? They are weak. They are frail. They are tired. I mean, the conceiving part, you know, I've read it enough. Her, her womb was barren. It was dead. Dead as, you know, a doorknob, I guess, whatever that saying is. But I'm picturing her carrying the child. I'm like, okay, I'm a woman. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so, but <laughs> aside from that, what does Abraham say? Or what is it said about Abraham in Romans 4, 19, 20? And not being weak in the faith, he did not consider his own body already dead and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So it was three days after we brought Krista to the hospital. There was no movement, nothing. In Dublin, my husband, he went to the hospital, I mean to the hospital, he went to the bathroom, which is the only privacy in the hospital to be able to pray. So he goes, it's midnight, it's on the ICU floor. And so he goes to the bathroom, which is way far from our room. And he asks God, God, what do we do? Um, are you wanting her to go home with you? Is it time to do that? Because we really want to know God. We want to follow you. And the Lord answered, I am going to heal her 110%. And that's a shock, right? Like Martha and Mary. Really? Um, so he asked God, God, will you give me a sign? Because this is really hard right now. And so Dublin, he goes back to the hospital room. And I'm already up. I'm there. And he's on one side. I'm on the other side. And we're just looking at Krista. And she opens her eyes. Boom. Immediately. I scream. Remember, it's midnight on the ICU floor. I scream. I'm thinking she woke up. The doctors do their checks and, you know, everything, testing her. And they say, no, no, this is just what people in comas do. It's a reflex. It doesn't mean anything. Well, after Dublin explained to me his time with God and what transpired, it did mean something. Yeah. I mean, my faith went through the roof. It was, you know, crazy. We are so thankful when we hear from God. And when we're believing in him and, and our perception changes and our eyesight is now on him. And believe it or not, that has sustained us all these years. God doing that. And that's what God does. He knows what it takes. He knows what to do. If we're only believing in him and having that faith, which brings me to my first point. We as Christians, are no more than what we believe. My husband and I, we could have looked only at those tests that were before us. We could have looked at our daughter, which was really a shell of what she once was. But like Abraham, we look to God. We are believers in the God Most High. Thank you, Jesus. So we cannot afford to be distracted, to look away. Our carnal nature, Satan, who tries to blur our eyesight and weaken our faith, we cannot allow that or afford that. The spiritually dead who don't have God think they are living. All the while they are gravitating. We see this and we know this. All the while gravitating to things that are dead, to things that are dead. We as believers, we know different. We know the power of God, or we should, 
We know the power of his word, or we should. We know. And any in unbelief, we are in trouble. When I believe God's word cannot save me, cannot help me, cannot be there for me, that is the beginning of death. We want to stay away from that road. And that also can make us cause, it can cause us to act out in ways that we wouldn't want to do as a believer. For us, faith is everything. And if we claim to be a believer, then we have to do something. Belief without action is not believing at all. One way to be sure of our faith is to watch how we respond. How do we act when God gives us an invitation? How do we how do we receive how do we respond to that? Do we respond in faith or do we respond in fear? Do we do we respond by going to God or do we go somewhere else? Okay. One way to help us keep on this track to keep us out of this pit of unbelief, despair and death is my second point. Faith needs facts. It needs the word of God. After God has Ezekiel wake up to the dead that's around him, and then he asks Ezekiel to believe in the impossible, he promises Ezekiel that he's going to bring the dead to life if he prophesies. And what does he prophesy? The word of God. One of the lessons that Jesus was teaching his apostles and what he is teaching us, what we really need to get, is that his word will come to pass. It will. God's word does not fail. In Isaiah 55 11, it says that God's word will not return void to him. It will accomplish what he desires and achieve the purpose for which he sent his word. In Romans 10, 17, it says, faith comes by hearing the word of the Lord. And finally, Paul in 2 Corinthians 3 says that we are walking epistles to be known and read by all men. So all of this together, all of it, what it's basically saying is that we're walking Bibles. And we should be biblical Christians. And when we prophesy and when we speak this word of the Lord, we are spreading eternal faith seeds. That's why it's so important. That's why at North Point Church, it's always read the Bible, read the Bible, because we are spreading as we speak it out loud. We are speaking faith seeds of eternity, of life and light. My husband and I, we had the Bible open every day in that hospital room for months, speaking out loud the word of God. We had music. Christian music is good. It has the lyrics that praise God, that have uh, God's word in it. And when you don't know what it did to me when God gave me Psalm 118.17 over Krista's life. So if I wasn't over there doing that, praising Jesus and wanting to truly listen to him, I wouldn't have heard that he said that she shall not die, but she shall live and tell what the Lord is, go what, what he has done. That is Psalm 118, 17, that she shall not die, but she shall live. And that is what we claimed over her life. Because what does, what does God say? God says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, how do we respond to God's word? How do we respond to his promises? But with a yes and an amen. 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 Yeah. We don't say, well, God's word is good, but I'm going to lay it aside over here. I'm going to lay it aside because you know what? It's not talking about my child. It's not talking about me. It's not talking about my marriage. It can't be. No, there is 
power in God's words to break the barriers, to raise the dead to life for all of us, for every single one of us. It matters what we believe. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, God. As Krista was discharged from the hospital, we had to meet with 25 people in this big, huge room. They were doctors, therapists. Um, the chaplain was there. And they all gave us a recommendation. It was unanimous. Listen to this one. So, as if we're not already, you know, in the grave, uh, so to speak. Um, we meet with all of these people, intimidating, yes. And we listened, and it was very convincing what they were saying. They said that, well, first of all, she's in a coma. You can't bring her home. She needs to go into an institution because you cannot care for her. There's too much care involved. Uh, it wouldn't be for her inter best interest or ours. We wouldn't be able to work jobs. We wouldn't be able to live our lives, you know, yada, yada, yada. But... And it was good stuff, right? Because we had to learn how to take care of a trach, an NG tube. I mean, and then she was already paralyzed. I mean, there's, she's a very highly medically complex person. A lot of care. In a coma. And then we have to do all this. So, um, God, that, that was man, first of all. That was man. So there's two separate things. Man is telling you what he thinks, his experience, what he knows, everything. And then we've got God. And God gave us a promise. And it's God that's going to walk us through this. Right? Because faith isn't a one-time deal. We brought her home. But it's not like, okay, you know, yes, I listened to God. I answered what he said. No, it is a walking out day by day, day by day. So when we brought her home, did it look impossible? Absolutely. I probably said it a million times. I've probably said it a million times since then. I mean, just the first month, I called 911 20 times in 30 days. Or not me, us. I wasn't by myself. And we would pray to God, like, we can't pay for food. We can't pay for our bills. I mean, our, our life looks like a complete mess. Friends, it, I mean, I think everybody just wanted to stay as far away from those crazy people. Like, they wanted us to put her in an institution. And that made a lot more sense because they could give her the care that she needed and, and things like that. So um, it's a daily, daily walk where we have to pick up our cross. We have to surrender it all and listen to God. Listen to him. Stay close to him. Because as I was, would say maybe that it was impossible one day, I would have to repent sometimes because of my doubt and say, God, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. You know, you said that you're going to help me. You know, why is all of this, you know, like horrible, horrible? I mean, I was never happy, but it's not about your feeling. It's about following God, right? So, you know, impossible, impossible. And so God, he washes us. He forgives us. It's, it's humbling to come to him when everything around us and inside of us is saying something entirely different. It's very humbling, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But death should stir something inside of us. It should cause us to go deeper. And I know that's what God wants us for us in North Point. We need to go deeper in our faith, in our spiritual walk, and just to remember who we are in humility and that he will help us grow. Which brings me to my third and final point. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. Psalm 35. My point is that fact plus no, faith plus facts produce joy. Faith, facts, joy. 
Remember that. <laughs> Faith backs joy. <laughs> because as we, as we obey the commands of God, as we prophesy over what is dead in our lives, our faith, our faith, and then something happens, and there's a rattle, a noise. Praise God, he is doing something. Yes, according to Smith Wigglesworth, which is one of my favorite dead people in the world, is, <laughs> everybody I listen to is dead, by the way. <laughs> it's like, oh, that preacher, really? Okay, I don't know, but I know this one. He was, you know, 100 years ago. Um, Smith Wigglesworth said, when faith lays hold, impossibilities must yield. When we touch the divine and believe in God, sins are forgiven, diseases go, and circumstances change. When we believe in the impossible, Romans 4.17 says, we are believing in a God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. With God, we are being transported to another place. It's the heavenlies. It's another world, another kingdom. Thank God for that. It's supernatural. And it's hard for us to understand that. But when we act in faith and in obedience, it is sweet. It is so sweet to leave that death behind, to walk away from death, to see when our, our prayers are answered, to see when someone is saved after years of tears and praying for that person, to see someone get up and walk again, like Krista's going to. But even though to even see her just to do those first purposeful moments, to see her speak for the first time after months and months, and that her brain was still intact. Yes. To see Jesus risen and out of the tomb and all that he has done for us, he did what he's done, the price that he paid for us, the, the pain, the separation that God went through. We can rejoice. We can rejoice and truly have joy and truly live. Which brings us to the grand finale. I have saved the best for last. Are you guys ready? Okay, I'm going to read this because it's easier to do that. Uh, verse 9 and 10, I'm going to read it again for all of us to hear. Out of Valley of Dry Bones. Then he said to me, then he said to Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. And they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Wow. Wow, you guys. You guys, that should be enough, right? God did it all. He does it all. What a powerful ending. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. But we can be thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ, what he's done for us. He has given us victory at the cross. When I think about this army, I immediately went to the book of Acts. Or it's called the Acts of the Apostles. And I like to call it in my situation here, the Acts of the Holy Spirit because that's what was guiding these apostles to act. It began on the day of Pentecost. It sounded like a violent wind, and there were what seemed like tongues of fire. All of them in the room were being filled with what? The breath of God, the Holy Spirit. 
And as Jesus ascended to the clouds, what did he say? He said that they would re receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them, come upon us. Power as apostles, lay people, men and women ministered, filled with the power to witness for Jesus, one by one, the church grew. The church grew geographically. It grew in stature, in power. It grew by numbers. That's how a church grows. Remember, we are the body of Christ. Yes. And what a picture it is to see this exceedingly great army, like it says in Ephesians 6, with our faith shield. I mean, there's the whole army, the armor that, you know, that's back there you can look at. But it talks about all of the pieces that are so important. But we can have our faith shield and our sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Who is this army again? Yes, this army is us. And we are being raised mightily, mightily to prophesy, mightily to do God's will, to follow God. Does anybody know, here know, have you been watching the news about Asbury University? Wow. How awesome is that? It started, so first of all, Asbury University is a Christian university. 1,600 uh, people attend there. It's in um, Wilmore, Kentucky. And what they thought on February 8th was going to be a one-hour service, like this, one-hour service, turned into a 16-day. Six, it just ended on the 24th. The 16th day of preaching and reading God's word and praying. And this town is only big enough for 6,000 people. And there were, I think, what did I read? Like 14,000 people coming to this revival. I mean, there wasn't even parking. There was, you know, not a place for people to go in the building. I mean, they were wait in lines. But it doesn't have to be a place, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Okay, I looked up some stats here, and I'm telling you, listen to this. There is a Pentecostal movement happening. In 1970, 5% of us were Pentecostal of the world. Now they're 25% is the number. And by the end of the century, they're saying 1 billion people will be Pentecostal. Dinesh Souza, who I think is a great resource, you guys, if you're looking up someone, Dinesh Souza, he posted that Muslims by the millions are converting to Christianity. This has never happened before. And the astounding explanation given by many of the converts is that they are seeing dreams and visions of Jesus. That's how it works with them. We have to pray dreams and visions into these people. We have a mosque on our street. We pray the blood of Jesus and they will have dreams and visions. In 2050, they, they say with the rise of Christianity, there will be three Christians to every two Muslims. In Africa, I didn't get the name. I think it was too hard for me to remember and say, but... Um, there's a town in Africa that the Christianity is growing faster than their population, which I'm guessing is saying a lot, anybody who knows African uh, deals like that. But what we're facing is, despite the mainstream news and all that we see in here, all the calamity, all the problems, 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 what is happening is that there is a new world that is embracing, and I read this, I didn't think this up, embracing a rising post-secular legacy. What does that mean? That means Christians, people who are believers, who, who believe in God. And we 
we want our church to grow. We want there to be an awakening. And the revival that I've been talking about is, is not just a, an event. It can be, yes. Because we, we want corporate. We want as many people, and if we can provide that, yes. But revival is really a state of mind. It's a state of mind. And um, I want to give you a couple of definitions because I really think we need reminding of what a Christian revival is. It is, and think about what we just all we all I just discussed, everything, Valley of Dry Bones, everything. What is a Christian revival? It is a spiritual reawakening from a state of dormancy or stagnation in the life of a believer. It's going from, it's us going from the deadness inside of all of us because we're all sinners. We're, God is raising us to life, even in a believer, in our daily faith walk. It is a resurfacing of love for God, appreciation of God's holiness, a passion for his word, his church, conviction of sin, humility, and a desire for repentance and growth. That is the definition for a Christian revival. It is a state of mind in where we are truly worshiping our Father. So what does true worship, what is the definition of that? It is submitting and doing God's will, guided by the Holy Spirit. That one person at a time, we can choose to give God all the glory. And what is truly living? Truly living is living for God. So when we say words like giving glory to God, and we're say, you know, we say resurrection and, and things like that, really what it means is that we are loving God with everything in us. Submission is beautiful. Like Krista, death was proclaimed over her. Those were the words. The words spoken over Krista were death, death, death. Okay? Not God's will. Not God's will. Remember that. Whenever, you know, those, those, um, the doctor gives you that report, you know, someone tells you something at your job. Just remember, that is man. Okay, yes, I'll take that into consideration. But God's will, that is what brings us out of death. When we believe God in faith, the atmosphere changes in our home, in our church, in our family. When we go to God's word, everything changes. Facts and faith produce joy. The joy comes in the morning. When does it come? When does the joy come? Yes, after we've repented, after we have given ourselves, surrendered, and we die for him. When we leave it all at the cross. So what does it say about Krista? Is she at 110%? Nope. Not yet. We have our daughter back. We have our daughter back. Not at 110%. She's here. This is what God says. So we're looking to God up here because that's where he wants to bring her. Because when God gives a promise, and he will, you stay close enough to him, he will give you your own personal promises. When he gives you his word, that will come to pass. We cannot go backwards. We have to go forward. This is no joke. I am not kidding. I'm telling you. God really, really, I mean, even Ezekiel in his situation, he didn't get to see. I mean, he, until he died, they're believing that he never left exile. He was he didn't get to see his nation being restored. But it's gone back. It's back. They're, the people are back. They are not scattered. They're not exiled. They are in Israel, and we have hope, and we can believe 
that when we respond to God, to his invitation, how are we going to respond? Because that's how the miracles happen. I mean, we say miracles are happening now. We're thankful for where Krista is at. But every day is a new day, a new morning, a new morning to praise Jesus, to believe in him once again, to have a revival in our hearts, to have a revival in our minds, to be revived, to come out of our graves. There is somebody that we know, at least one person, probably, we're probably like Ezekiel, we're probably surrounded by the spiritually dead. I know we are when we turn the TV on, I know when we, you know, in our normal course, but in our close family units, there are people that we can pray for, believe, they, it is not dead, their addiction is not dead. Krista's legs do not move. And we are believing she's going to get up and walk because that's another story that was given to me when she was in the womb, that she would walk. And that actually, that's just a little thing that I'm adding, but that helped me this time round when they said she was gone. Because the first time round, they said, well, first of all, they didn't want me to have her. They, you know, they pushed, you know, because she would be too hard to take care of again, too much work. God's child, God's beautiful child, but we have to believe, and I was a baby Christian, and I was told that she was going to walk, and that gave me faith, and when this happened this time, I was like, God, wait a minute, whoa, wait, they're saying dead, you know, this is before God said he was going to heal her, just in that first beginning, the days, it came to my mind, I remembered, but God when she was in the womb, you know, you said that she was going to walk. So how, I mean, I know you're not talking about heaven, because I'm not there, I'm here. So, yeah, okay, she's going to walk, and these people are saying she's dead, basically. So, yeah, so God brought her out of that, and we're, I don't know what, what number we're at, but God says 110%. That's what we believe. And so I am asking all of you, because I'm going to tell you something. It takes courage to walk outside of these doors and to be set apart. Because if you want to follow the crowd, we don't know. You know, there's a lot of things that can happen. But when we follow Jesus, we have certainty. We have certainty that he will bring the dead alive. Our God is a God that makes everything possible. Amen. And if you keep, and I'm, I'm going to add this as well, that if you keep living your way, making, living, living your days, making those choices for faith, no matter how hard they look, just obeying God, obeying God, following him, no matter how bad it looks, just keep going, keep going. Your faith is going to grow. You're going to see the change. And you know what? I have had times where everything looked possible. Everything looked possible. I couldn't see anything else. I could only see through God's eyes because that's what it takes. It takes believing those little decisions, those big decisions, the daily decisions. Just keep walking it out, walking it out. Come to church, talk to people, get help, read your word, pray, prophesy, claim it. Claim it over your home. In Jesus' mighty authority, there is a revival here now. We can claim it. There's a revival when you get home. There's a revival at your school. There's a revival at your work. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing the dead back to life. So we need to ask ourselves the question. Do we dare to believe God in the impossible? Because if we don't take it up another notch, God's not going to do it for us. We have to choose to participate to be with him. Because we are his soldiers. An exceedingly great army. Which means none of this matters. None of this matters. Nothing. 
my husband always says, don't get attached. No attachments here. Always saying that. So God be with you guys. And I am just believing for the impossible. And I am hoping that it is our group soon that sees Krista get up out of the wheelchair and walk. Because if it sounds like we're crazy, good, good. Let's be crazy. I want to be the totally crazy off the wall church. Yes. yes. Set apart for his holiness. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.